All right. Uh, thank you. First, before we get started, I just want to thank all of the people that put this together. Uh, the, the crew from First American, First American Home Warranty, uh, Eric Bible at Yale Home Loans. Um, who am I missing? Rory Revere, who's over here. Amanda Wood, uh, First American as well. There's Rory in the back. And Heritage Escrow. Sorry, Jared. I, I said Lisa and Heritage Escrow. Thank you. I'm a little nervous. I'm not used to talking in front of this people. Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, our guests of honor here. So if, if you guys haven't um, been here before, we talk a lot about strategy, a lot about how we can add value uh, to our clients' lives. And, and every single week, the market came up over and over and over. Uh, and while Eric and I did our best uh, to to talk about the market and the things that we were reading, um, it, it became very evident that we needed to have some experts. And so uh, I'm, I'm really happy and uh, grateful that both of you guys decided to come and spend some time with us today. I'll start with Brian. Uh, so Ryan Ratcliffe is at the University of San Diego. Uh, he formerly worked on the Anderson forecast. If you're not familiar with the Anderson forecast, uh, it is the most heavily weighted forecast in the state of California. Uh, it literally was the only forecast of its time advised presidents, uh, I think all the way back to Eisenhower, maybe. Uh, Brian, Brian might be able to tell you, tell you, tell you more about the history of it. I, I think he was working for the forecast at that time, though. Um, but Ryan, I'd love for you to just take a minute and introduce yourself. And I would think of, um, just so you know, the thought behind the two gentlemen that you have up here. You guys have a lot of exposure to The Economist for Zillow. And the Economist for uh, the, the Association of Realtors, uh, and and what I was hoping to get is one macro person and one micro person, uh, and I I love that we've got kind of that mix here today. And what I love about Brian is that no one uh, pays him other than this the, this university, right? So uh, he does not have a vested interest in the data that he is uh, deciphering, um, and so. I think that's really unique when you're getting an economic perspective. And uh, Brian, thank you for being here today. Want to want to introduce yourself? There's a microphone right there. Anything else I missed that these people should know about you? Uh, no, not particularly. I've been here in San Diego. Um, so my stint at the UCLA forecast uh, ended in 2008. So I was ringside for the uh, kind of run up to the uh, to the Great Recession. Uh, moved down here and uh, bought a house in 2008. That was probably the best financial decision of my life. Um, uh, but yeah, I've been here uh, at uh, University of San Diego for the uh, for the time. I'm in the uh, business school and uh, yeah, macroeconomics and the San Diego economy specifically are kind of my two uh, special areas of interest. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Ryan, for being here today. We appreciate it. And our other panelist is Scott Wild. Uh, Scott, I know a lot less about you, so I, I know that that sounded uh, I have a lot of uh, in, intimate details about the Anderson forecast. But um, Scott is the guy that we brought in for the microclimate. Um, and Scott works with John Burns, uh, which is a real estate consulting firm. They're based out of Orange County. Uh, and what I love about Scott is that he's constantly sizing up deals for developers. And why that's really important is because what your clients are asking you and asking us at the end of the day is not what they can do, it's what they should do, right? And that's exactly what builders are asking of Scott and John Burns. Uh, they're buying property that needs to be entitled, it needs to go through legal uh, fights. Let's just, just say uh, a lot of times they're buying land that's sometimes up, up to you know 10 years before sticks come out of the ground and so Scott is sizing up land and development deals um, to advise uh, developers uh, as well as local builders here in the United States. And so uh, I wanted somebody who was an expert on local housing, uh, and that is Mr. Scott Wild. So Scott, thanks for being here, and please fill in any blanks that uh, that I might have missed there. You said you didn't know anything about me. <laughs> that was a pretty long list. Um, yeah, so John Burns Real Estate Consulting is a national firm. Uh, I run most of our Southern California. So working with home builders, working with developers of all sizes and scope throughout California. I am based here in San Diego, so although I do a lot less work in San Diego than I do the other uh, SoCal markets, just because there's less fun activity here. It's a little hard to hear. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. A little bit closer? Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that's number I can just one. There. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So like I said, I, I do less work in, in San Diego, but I am based here. So I do focus on it uh, intently when I do get work here. And, and frankly, a lot of my work in San Diego with less than home development is based on looking at the resale market, looking at existing homes. So it does get very granular in, in what we do, particularly in markets like Encinitas, Carlsbad, both have San Diego where it's such little new development that you really have to get creative and you can base your value assumptions of how you compare things and uh, create accurate forecasts. Fantastic. Right, try that one. Okay. Is that, is that better? Yeah. yeah. You guys hear better? Yeah. It's more important to hear in than me, right? I know. Okay. Yeah. So number one question, and, and since you're holding the microphone, Scott, let's start with you. Uh, and, and I know you guys, your biggest skill is not economy, it's not answering questions. So uh, no one here is gonna hold you to anything. We really just wanna know what your opinion is and why. So Scott, what is gonna happen to housing? It's the number one question that we get. We wanna know. Well, I'm, I'm glad we started off with the <laughs> This, this young woman in the back said, let's get down to business. And so uh, we're not messing around. Hey, this is what I'm used to, so no, no worries. Um, that is the question that's on everybody's mind, right? Just with the change in, uh, in mortgage interest rates and with kind of shifting winds in the economy overall, how does this impact housing? Because housing has been on such a strong run for so long. And everyone has kind of been saying that it can't continue forever. The band will stop playing at some point. I, I often tell people, uh, I started in the industry uh, in 2004, so I got to uh, working for a public home builder, so I had a lot of fun for the next four or five years. Um, I often tell people that like people who remember and worked in, the, in real estate and home building in the mid-2000s are still relatively traumatized by what the last recession was like. Shell-shocked, however you want to say it, it was an experience that was very, very bad for a lot of people. Um, and that's not what a typical housing downturn looks like. So I think there is, there is the, the danger of, of any time you say that there's going to be a slowdown in housing, that we think there's going to be blood in the streets, everyone's going to get kicked out of their homes, we're all going to lose our jobs. And that's not necessarily what happens in a typical downturn. It's just you know, a slowing in kind of the frenzy pace that's been going on for, for so long here. So our general overall perspective on where housing is going over the next few years is that things will slow down. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're seeing continued price appreciation through this year, through most of next year, with some softening towards the end of next year, in line with the, the rest of the national economy, maybe tipping into what could be defined as a recession. We'll see. Um, but all that said, we don't have any signs of that really happening yet. So we've kind of been projecting something similar to happen for some time. I think we have more trends that are pointing towards that right now, uh, but nothing that says- Sorry, hey, you have more trends pointing toward what right now? More, more trends kind of supporting, hey, things should and maybe could slow down. And a lot of that's just affordability, right? With prices rising, interest rates rising now, it becomes more difficult for every single person at every single price segment to afford the home than it was you know, a year ago. We're looking at housing costs in San Diego that just between price appreciation and mortgage, mortgage rates, homeownership costs have gone up 35% across the board that's that's a huge number so it, it has to in, impact the overall economy and the housing market specifically at some point but again we don't have anything specific that we're saying hey we see the first signs listings aren't rising prices aren't declining as, as you guys know there's still a huge amount of demand so we're just trying to be to, to have some foresight look ahead and, and look at what we think is going to happen but i can't you know nail something to the wall and say hey this is why i think so that makes a lot of sense. I just want to simplify what you said. Uh, hey, housing can't go on forever. Like this is definitely going to slow down uh, at, at some point. Uh, if it does slow down, or, or I'm going to go just be an extremist and say if it dips, if, if values come down, it's going to be norm, more normal. It's not going to be like 2008, right? And I'm and I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, maybe a little. No, bit. that's a, that's a great way to say it. Is that it, it will? The housing market has been very beneficial for a for a lot of people in this room for the last few years. But it has never, definitely not been normal. I wouldn't describe almost any aspect of the moment. It's been so much demand, so much price growth, and just so many. It's been so difficult to to compete for homes. You know, you still have even today with the change in mortgage rates, people are expected to build over asking price on almost everything in San Diego. That's not a normal market. So even just having that change would be a big change in the current condition. But it is really just bringing things closer back to home, not a traumatic 
mid 2000s downturn. I love it. And guys, there's uh, pads of paper on your tables. Um, please write down your questions. I'm going to ask a few questions and we're going to spend at least half of the time uh, with your questions. So you all will have a chance uh, to ask questions as well. So write down uh, and, and we'll come back to your questions. Even if, it's, uh, if I don't ask what you're thinking uh, in the middle of this. Ryan, I'd love to hear uh, the same question to you, man. What's going to happen to housing? I... Uh, Whoa. Oh, sorry. Maybe I turned up the wrong light. No, I got professor voice too. Sorry, I'll get out of that here. Um, and everybody hearing him a bit. I think I agree with the broad outlines that uh, none of the special factors like uh, you know the negative equity situation, strategic defaults, a lot of the stuff that we saw uh, in 2008, 2009 that put such downward pressure on prices. Uh, exist in the market today. So I think we're going back to more 1990s uh, style slowdown, which is to say it's primarily a volume cycle. So we'll go through a period of uh, lower sales and that will put the brakes on appreciation, but not any, you know, I, I have a number of uh, people who've recently, you know, new professors at USD recently moved here. They look at the housing market and go, oh gosh. Okay, so my strategy is I'm gonna wait for the recession Prices will go down 25%, and then I'm going to swoop in and pick up. I was like, no, 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 no. Let me show you a couple pictures. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think kind of a slowdown in sales and really, you know, flat, slightly drifting downward prices, I think, would be what I'd expect in the next couple of years. Um, I think the fundamentals in terms of the long term outlook for the San Diego economy and demographics and so on all point to. Uh, you know, in the long run, we're not going to turn into Detroit or anything where it's going to be a ghost town and nobody's going to want to live in San Diego more or uh, anything along those lines. So I think this is sort of a uh, question about whether you want to look at the next, you know, 18 to 24 months. Uh, I think you look out kind of past that, we'll get back to, the, you know, we'll see again a market more like uh, what we're used to. Yeah, so... Uh, I want to recap on one thing that you said there, um, which you said downward pressure from strategic defaults, uh, bringing prices down. And so, you know, put very simply, a lot of people got into real estate that could not afford to get into real estate. Uh, and that had a huge effect nationally on our economy uh, because when there was a little bit of pressure economically, people couldn't make those payments, right? They were counting on the equity. When they couldn't make the payments, they had to foreclose. Everybody foreclosed at once, and there was a bunch of supply coming. In this market, uh, mortgages have been more regulated than they've ever been. How many people do you guys have right now that can totally afford a house, and they're having a little bit of trouble with the loan, or they're having to get a bank statement loan, or you know whatever the situation is? There's a lot of, of those folks, right? And it's a lot harder to get access to credit like that. So I think going back to what Scott said, uh, and you alluded to, Ryan, there's a lot of trauma that comes from what happened globally, but fundamentally, those characteristics just do not exist this time around. And that is the major difference this time between 2008. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Cool. So it, it sounds like both uh, both of you think that, that prices are going to slow down, even dip. It's really hard for me. And I know you said, hey, we just think that's going to happen because we see rates going up. We don't see any data supporting that. As a microcosm of what's going on in San Diego County, and you know, I'm doing you know, 10 to 20, uh, financing 10 to 20 uh, folks every single month. I cannot believe, I was saying this to Scott, the amount of wealth and the amount of people that are, are backed up uh, wanting these properties. And so one thing that comes up for me when I hear these guys say that there might be a, a slight flattening of prices or even a dip is that we might finally see some supply open up and you all might actually have a lot more transactions to do. And I think that that's really contradictory of how we think um, because right now people are frozen. Uh, they don't have a place to go and that's one of the reasons that they're not selling. So that's just something that comes up for me. Um, I think the next question, the second next question that we get is, hey, interest rates are too high. And to your point, you both said that you fear there might be some, actually there has to be a recession at some point. We just don't know when it's coming, right? But it's normal for our economy to recess now again. 
But what would you say uh, you believe is going to happen with interest rates in the short term? And then if we do get into a recessionary period, uh, Ryan, since you have the mic, let's start with you. Um, well, I think you've got to start this story with what's going on with inflation right now. We're seeing inflation uh, that we haven't seen since the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, that puts the Fed in a box because the mission statement that Congress gave to the Fed is maximum employment and stable prices, and stable prices is usually uh, understood to be something more like 2% inflation. So uh, there is a big fat red alarm going off on uh, Powell's desk right now saying you're not doing your job. And, uh, you know, we think that seeing uh, the 10 year treasury and mortgage rates, you know, rise on the order of about 2%. I think we got a lot more of that in the future based on the, uh, we, we've seen the Fed make some head fake moves in terms of when you're talking about basis point increases in the federal funds rate as a response to this, um, the equivalent inflation fighting move that the Fed chair pulled uh, in 1981, 1982 was a 9%, 900 basis points uh, increase in the, uh, well, okay, more like 10 for the federal funds rate and then the 10-year treasury went up uh, about 9% from where the inflation fighting uh, started. Hang, That's not okay. have more hang on, <laughs> hang on one second. Like, just in case you guys aren't following, I just want to simplify this for a second. Inflation is high, and that's bad. Inflation is just prices getting higher. Uh, the cost of goods are getting higher, right? And that's bad. So the federal government, that's Jerome Powell, right? He says, okay, we got to take action. So the action that they're taking is raising the federal funds rate. If they raise that federal funds rate, inflation goes down. So he alluded to 1980s. Uh, when was that Volker? Volker. Yeah. Look how smart I am. <laughs> I want a cookie or something. Um, right. So it, tomorrow the Fed is meeting, and and everyone, pretty much everyone that I'm watching, thinks that we're going to have a half a point increase to the federal funds rate. What he's talking about, what happened in the 1980s, was a nine points. Not a half percent, nine percent increase to the Fed funds rate. So when he says fifty basis points versus nine hundred basis points, I want you guys to know what that means. Where's the Fed fund rate sit right now? Anybody? Eric, do you know? Three and, three and a half. Okay, I thought it was three and a quarter. Okay, three and a half. Cam, it's good to see you. So three and a half. That would be like our Fed funds rate going from three and a half to twelve and a half. Tomorrow it's supposed to go to four percent. Now, this is not mortgage rates. This is the, the rate at which banks borrow from one another. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. All you need to know is that if inflation is high, in general, rates are also going to be high. So what he's talking about is our government's going to intervene and try to get rid of inflation. When they did that in the 80s, they raised the Fed fund rate to, to nine points, which would be 12. Uh, we're currently at three and a half. So tomorrow, they're talking about a half basis point for I just want to make sure I'm simplifying what you're saying. You're saying, hey, 50 basis points, it's not really going to do much. Well, I think a lot of us are looking at a you know 5% 30-year uh, fixed mortgage going, it's the apocalypse. I've never seen anything this crazy in recent history. And I feel like we're only just seeing the beginning of this cycle. Scott wanted me to say that I don't think we're going to see a 900 basis point uh, increase in long, uh, long-term long interest rates. I would agree that that seems like the extreme end. But I think the other point I would make is that the Fed is very explicitly, so let's back up and talk about inflation. Simplest terms, it is, you know, we all know why prices go up. It's more people want to buy something than is it's available for offer. And inflation is kind of an economy-wide version of that uh, phenomenon. So if you want to bring inflation down, you got to do one of two things. You either have to come up with a way for us to be able to bring more goods and services to markets. This is kind of the all the supply chain post-COVID issues you hear about, that's kind of the why the supply isn't uh, necessarily there. And then we've had all of the uh, you know, repressed spending uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, on the demand side with everybody wanting to buy stuff. And so if you want to fight inflation, you either have to solve the supply chain crisis or you have to get people to want to buy less than they currently do. And the interest rate hiding strategy is very much a, let me punch the economy in the stomach as hard as I can, uh, raise interest rates uh, with the goal of, you know, creating a recession in a situation where people don't want to buy as much 
for a year or two. And that dynamic of taking away the demand side pressure is what eventually brings inflation back. It's really well said. Thank you. Yeah. You like the gut punch? I, I, I don't know if I agree with the gut punch, but it's a very vivid uh, image for sure. Well, and I think it's an important distinction. The past several recessions that we've had have all been something happened in the economy to make consumers or businesses decide they want to spend less. And then the Fed kind of rides to the rescue with lower interest rates and the opposite of what I've been saying. This is very much the Fed saying, no, Congress told us they don't want inflation this high. We have to do something about it. We have to be the bad guy. So we're going to raise interest rates and basically engineer a recession. That's how you uh, bring inflation back. Interest, I've never heard that analogy, and it's very interesting. So what would you say to the fact that this, this federal government has been pretty cautious uh, that they're late to the party for sure. It feels like a hurry up offense. Um, so if supply chain does automatically open up, right? Let's say that COVID fears go away. Uh, China does the, it, it, you know, stops the zero lockdown policy. We start to get chips for our cars and appliances for our home and lumber and all the supply starts to come through. Because one of the things you said was that supply could be a solve. Uh, I can see you already have. I think that's kind of what uh, the Fed and Powell and the rest of the open market committee are hoping for. Frankly, they're in a little bit of a let's let's slow roll this a little bit. Let's raise uh, interest rates a little bit just to show we're serious because a lot of this is about signaling and what the market thinks is going to happen later based on what you did today. Um, but if we cross our fingers and wish on a star and do every other superstitious thing we can think of. If the supply side constraints start to relax a little bit, then they don't have to be as aggressive as bringing uh, spending caps. So that's kind of the rosy soft landing scenario that you hear everybody talking about. Um, that uh, you know that the supply side constraints ease, and the people who want to buy all of this stuff find it a little easier to, and those prices there's not as much upward pressure on prices. Uh, so the likelihood of that scenario that is a uh, it's kind of a 50 50 pick of me i can't i do not want to pretend that i can tell you when the lockdown in shanghai is going to end <laughs> yeah, or how they, you know how the uh, cure the bottlenecks at the port and the great resignation and its effect on retail and, you know we can we have another four or five days we can get into all of that sort of stuff but. no i appreciate it i think just just the understanding about what's causing it so um now you've alluded to this gut punch and forcing a recession, you know, several times. Um, I I have to be a little bit honest, like in a self-serving way. Not that I want our economy to recess, but that means low interest rates, which means all these people that I'm putting in these houses at five percent interest rates, I could refinance because, gosh, I don't want them. To have oh, such I'm a sorry, I need to check you on this a little bit. So right. I know what you're saying. Yep. But it's the you know, I said sort of the past three set recessions were used to the Fed kind of riding the rescue flow interest rates. Something else happens and the Fed comes to try to push it as well. This is the Fed is going to step on our neck. So I'm moving from a gut punch to now stepping on the neck of the economy, moving <laughs> up. Uh, but they're going to keep their foot on the neck of the economy until inflation comes down. So this is not a recession they're trying to fight with low interest rates. This is inflation they're trying to fight with high interest rates. And the recession is the consequence of what they have to do to this inflation. So I don't think a recession, no, we're going to have low interest rates more. That's not the right way to think about this oh. sort of recession. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. It's, it's, it's funny to see the um, I've got happy stuff I can talk about too. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, no, but I think it is, It's if, if you take one thing away from kind of all of my interest rate macro stuff, that this is a different kind of potential recession in the last three or so that we've lived through, and it takes a different, you have to kind of reset your thinking a little bit about what to expect. You know, we've got a lot of, you know, like this basic, yeah, mortgage rates go down in a recession, and that's kind of what, you know, we, we, we come out strong. This one would be a little different. Interesting. Um, uh, so why do you think it's different just because it was caused by COVID and we haven't seen that before? Or, or what is the major difference here? You're saying this is different. Yeah, but so I would different. say that the past the past three recessions have really been, you know, some sort of spending shock. Just a we changed our spending behavior, whether it's consumers, whether it's businesses. Um, 
And that was kind of the kickoff of the recession. And then the Fed responded, you know, remember it said maximum employment and stable prices are the two things in the Fed's mission statement. So when they see a spike in unemployment, they can kind of say, all right, here's where I'm going to come in and lower interest rates as a, uh, as a tool to stimulate more spending, get people who were not really inclined to before. Now money is so cheap, uh, you know, go out and uh, do more investment spending, do more uh, consumption, buy some out, buy some homes, these sorts of things. Um, so the Fed is responding to something happening kind of in the private economy the past three recessions. I'm saying this one is going to be the Fed did it. They're the culprits. They will admit that, yeah, we, we, we need a recession to bring down this inflation, so we're going to deliver one. The way we're going to deliver it is with high interest rates. That makes total sense to me. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I heard a question, how high are they going to go? I heard, a, heard six raises, which puts us a point and a half higher, and tomorrow is going to be a half. Well, one, so one of the things that makes this a little murky, there are some kind of back of the envelope rules for uh, how much you need to raise the interest. Well, one thing I'll say for sure is that if inflation goes up, you know, so if you think about the, the past couple of times, you keep hearing numbers of, well, it was 5%, then it was 6%, then it was 7%. If inflation goes up 1% and you raise, interest rates by, you know, 0.25% or so, in terms of what we think of as the, the real interest rate, the one that matters is the difference between those two, kind of the, your money grows at this rate, and then inflation eats this much of the way through higher prices. Um, if you're not keeping up with how fast prices are rising, you're actually effectively lowering the interest rate by not raising it in step with, with, uh, with inflation. Yeah. So when investors think about this, if they're getting a 5% return on their money and inflation currently at, let's just call it 8.5%, they're losing 3.5%. So what you're saying there is that we got a while to go uh, until these interest rates catch up with an inflation and we're gonna see higher interest rates. Welcome, so glad you guys came. <laughs> I hope you're wrong. <laughs> but. I hope this Thanks whole so. supply side thing loosens itself up and we don't have to get too aggressive with the scenario plans out. Well, and I think it has to at some point that the, the, the real question is when is that going to happen and what sort of an effect will that have, right? If, if all of a sudden chips come and there are tons and tons of cars because we were overbuilt uh, with automobiles uh, just very, just prior to COVID. So, you know, now we have cars going for over MSRP. Um, and if all these chips are there and the demand can be met, it stands to reason that those prices will come down. Uh, with oil, if oil starts to come over and there's no, uh, you know, our pumps start working, uh, which, which I understand takes two years in some cases, and the war ends and now we have oil, it stands to reason the oil price can go down. So I do think that supply chain will help some of this, but the big question is we just have no idea when that's gonna happen. Would you agree with that statement? Am I thinking about that the right way? I don't yes, want to I think the other thing I'd say though, to bring it back to, to us here, 40% uh, of the CPI, the single biggest component in the consumer price index is what we call shelter, right? It's your house, it's whether you're renting it or whether, I don't wanna get into the government's game of a homeowner is a business owner who rents to themselves, but they have a weird accounting trick they do with this. Um, but, uh, you know, so even if, uh, you know, the ports unlock and oil and all that, we're still not uh, going to see a sudden new wave of building in San Diego County, right? So there's still going to be supply side constraints in a lot of the other categories that matter, even if the more kind of globalized trade or goods part starts to Yeah. That was awesome. Um, Scott, I'd love to hear Please from you and just like <laughs> any comments. Uh, thank well, you so much, Ren. I will say there's a little bit of good and bad news in what you just said, which is that the difference between this recession and the last one and a lot of recessions is that this is this is not driven by housing. Housing is, a, is in a very good spot. Like you said, uh, mortgage underwriting has been very diligent. It's been very strict, maybe even too strict is what people would say. For sure. You would definitely. <laughs> um, so there's not the threat of a balloon that pops in, in the housing environment because there's just not that much supply. San Diego in particular, and most of Southern California, it changes a little bit when you get out to the Inland Empire, but most of Southern California is, has been undersupplied for decades, and no matter what we do, it's going to continue to be undersupplied. Um, the bad news with that is, like you said, there's 
the demand for housing is going to remain high regardless of it can lessen a little bit if uh, unemployment goes up if incomes you know stop growing at the rate that they are right now but demand for housing is still going to be very high because it's been so undersupplied in San Diego and Southern California for so long. So the driver of inflation in, like you said, 40% is, is shelter. And a big portion of that is rents, is, is where rents are going. And right now, the people that can't afford to buy, what are they doing? They're renting. And the rents are in spiking just like home prices were. And they're kind of trailing along the same trend. So even if home prices slow down, flatten, even decline, still have a bunch of people who would like to be homeowners who make great money well educated they're hitting those milestones of, of household formations and adult milestones or they would typically be a homeowner they just can't afford to do it unless they want to leave southern california which some people are doing so they end up becoming renters they pay more for rent they want newer nicer units which are in shorter supply because we haven't been building as many of those and it drives rents up and kind of counterbalances what the fed is trying to do so it's uh it's a little bit of a headwind and a tailwind so uh, I think I want to make sure, here's what I'm piecing together by what you guys said. One of the biggest concerns that homeowners have is affordability, especially here uh, in San Diego. Like even in this room, we just talk about units that are going for two, $3 million, um, you know, that were trading at half that, you know, four years ago. So it's been an insatiable spike. Um, and my fear is that I'm more worried about housing run, running away from people, meaning they can no longer get into the housing market, than I am worried about a housing crash, just based on the data that I'm seeing. And so that, you know, when when we take, I'm, I'm pointing to Kamala because she does a lot of the, the loan consultations, but we're spending an hour and a half with clients and we're telling them like, look, we have a 13 year deficit of home building because I think they don't understand why, like why is this market racing away? And when we get done, a lot of those clients are like, man, this makes so much more sense and they're a lot more enrolled in the process, right? And I think a lot of people to your point, are they're just, even us in this room, we went through 2008 and it's like, man, we don't want to give the wrong advice to these clients who are depending on us, just like you guys, like afraid to say something because you're worried that, you know, somebody's gonna plan their whole life around you know, what you think is going to happen. And so, but what I'm hearing you say is that affordability is going to be an issue, but also that there's so much demand for what San Diego has. And I hear what you're saying, Ryan, and I think about defense spending uh, and, and how much government work uh, we have here and how much biotech. Um, and I just feel like housing, while it may stall, is going to continue to be, you know, we might go from this, insane appreciation to you know more normal appreciation um do you guys agree with that do you see any flaws in that in that plan or any wild cards no i think that's a good way to look at it is that we are headed back towards a somewhat more normal market so housing fundamentals become a little bit more true to their history right and and i think it is it is dangerous giving people advice when it comes to housing because it's so critical for people but the tried and true advice of if you're buying a home that you can afford and you're going to be able to afford over the next few years, you're in a good position. I don't I don't think that um, any of us are seeing a, a housing collapse or something that just changes the market to where even if you made a good decision, you can afford the home you purchased or something's going to come up and sneak up on you that you don't see. I, I don't think anybody's predicting something like that because there has been su just such a limit on the amount of new supply that's been able to come to the market even with the off the charts historic demand and price appreciation that we've seen over the last decade now, there's just only so many homes that can be built in San Diego and only so many things you can get approved. And look here at Encinitas, anytime you try to build housing, you run out of town with, with pitchforks. Um, no offense, Encinitas, I live here, I love it. But they, it's, it's, it is NIMBYism, but it's not another term for it. Um, so there's a lot of opposition to getting higher density housing that starts to really meet the volume need that, that would be there to, to change the dynamics of uh, housing demand and supply in, in San Diego and in Southern California. And frankly, I don't see that change for the foreseeable future. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? You concerns around affordability? Uh, I do think that that's one of the sort of long-term risks to economic growth in San Diego over the next 20 years or so. 
just that we kind of go, what I think of is this is around Santa Barbara, which is, this is a fabulous place to live if you got rich somewhere else and can afford to move here and enjoy the scenery, but it's not a place where you start to start your career. There's just no place to live that, uh, that meets that. So, you know, kind of the gamut of housing from the, uh, you know, the, the high end, uh, properties down to the what can somebody for you know what if what is a first time home buyer buy in San Diego at the moment? Uh, you know I think that's kind of a pretty critical question uh, for long term growth. And I've heard a hundred you know my friends at Sandag have all talked about well clearly what we need is you know five story condos from Oceanside all the way down to the border uh, and the density will solve the problem just fine. And, yeah, so there's lots of crazy ideas. One thing that's kind of interesting, it's, I don't know, it's one of those fascinating why I love being an economist. Uh, so we got lots of people who want to live here and the housing stock is basically the same. One of the pressure release valves for this has actually just been more people per house. If you look at what the census has to say about household size, and there's just more people, you know, multi-generational uh, families in a house, et cetera, that this is kind of becoming one of the, how do you, uh, how do you address affordability? It's not a single family home anymore. It's a single family home that's actually got multiple generations of the same family, or even we're going to put up a shower curtain and call it duplex. Uh, there's some, there's some, you know, there's some crazy reactions. It's a good uh, one. Look, they laughed at that shower curtain and call it a duplex. They've all done that. That's why they're laughing. Well, but, but I'm saying that they finally sold it. People, people will find a way around this constraint, even if it's one that you know I would love to have. A single family, uh, you know, just my family in a home, just like my parents did. But if in the market, you know, maybe we go in and form a collective and we all buy that $2 million house and we have eight people in there or something like that. So, I mean, you, you, you're you starting to see a little bit of the demographics. Yeah, I think the ADU law that, that uh, you know, that was passed in California presented an amazing opportunity. You know, you look at the fundamentals. Um, I was just looking at a neighborhood where it costs $200,000 uh, to, to put up a thousand square foot pre-approved, Encinitas pre-approved, you know, ADU. And that thousand dollars is trading for a thousand dollars a square foot. So a family, you know, $200,000 on a loan, it, it used to cost 550 bucks. Maybe it's probably $650 now with taxes, you know, all that stuff included. So $1,200, but they're increasing you know, the, the value of that home by 800, uh, you know, because it's going for a thousand dollars a square foot right now and rents to your point, it, 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 it seems like rents are not going to soften, you know, because homeowners might be driven out, but will have to rent at that point. So they're still going to stay in that pool. So that's encouraging to me, especially because the statistics that I have are one out of every six homes is being purchased by an institutional investor or an investor. And so these investors are chasing yield, right? They're not like you and I, they're not like the clients that we're representing. They want to make yield. They're, they're buying this house at a million bucks and they're renting it out and they're hoping that it, it goes for 1.2 in, in a couple of years. So if that yield goes away, do we have a, a supply dump? Uh, you know, and, and what you're saying uh, Scott, sorry, I forgot your name for a second. Uh, but what you're saying is that rental market is really strong. Yeah, exactly. I think even if there was a supply is so low, and it's been so low for so long, that even if there was a, I mean, I think some of us are kind of hoping to see that happen, right? It's, it's, a, it's a rush of, you know, we went from under one month of supply to two months of supply. I don't think that would impact pricing at all. I think you'd just see more people. You'd see a lot of people who frankly are kind of sitting on the sidelines right now who said, I'm tired of making 30 offers, getting none of them accepted. I'm tired of offering 10% above list and getting laughed at and getting outbid by somebody who comes in at the last minute. It's just, it's a frustrating market for a lot of people. So I think there is kind of a, a shadow demand too of people who just are, have tried and are frustrated and aren't, aren't looking anymore. And people who are just bleeding, um, frankly, which isn't a great strategy as, as most of you know. But um, so I think there is a, is a buffer to any new supply that would come even if it was somewhat of a rush, I think there's there's a limit to any, any downside that would come from that. And like you said, if it's an institutional investor or a flipper who's come in and is looking to make money, they're going to wait to to get their money. I mean, at some point you have to make a decision, but they're, they are driven by that profit, not necessarily I need to sell my house because I'm moving my family into a new one. They'll wait and, and try to make that internal rate of return that they're targeting. Yeah. 
Interesting. Um, I think that's it for me for uh, the questions that I have that I knew all of you would have as well. And so I would love to, uh, I would love to just before I open it up for questions in the crowd, we'll, we'll run a mic out there. Um, I would love to just ask you guys in general, um, what do you, uh, so, so two questions. One, what are the wild cards? Because they're always like, well, this is going to happen. But if this happens, then, you know, that doesn't happen. So one of those things is COVID is magically cured and, and it's no longer here anymore and, 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 and supply chain opens up. So we talked about that, right? Um, but what are the things that you feel like this real estate community um, needs to know that maybe doesn't or is really tough to, uh, to explain? I think kind of the wild cards that we are monitoring right now are looking for is, is really more sentiment driven and, and narrative driven than anything else. If we quickly do meet the definition for a recession, and that could happen more quickly, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to, to technically qualify to be in a recession. You might not even notice until it's until it gets uh, retroactively called. Um, if that changes economic perspectives really quickly at the same time that say supply gets better, and at the same time, the rates have the Fed has moved aggressively to 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 uh, tamp down inflation. If that all could happen at one time, you would have a convergence of events that I think everybody would the Fed might regret moving so aggressively. Um, but that would be a convergence of everything kind of happening all at the wrong time. So again, just just watching kind of the sentiment if that changes real quickly, we're in a you know a political environment that's that shifts very quickly. Too. So that that is really the wild the, the one wild card that we frankly have to acknowledge has more impact now than it has in recent history is that the people's opinions and the media narrative can change really quickly and that has an impact on everything that can shift on a dime. Interesting. So the polarization uh, in the media has a bigger impact now than it ever has. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I think it's just it's easier for some unseen, unforeseen cause or something that people get behind to just take off and run that would really, I mean, overnight. Yeah, interesting. Uh, thank you, uh, that's great. Brent, same question to you, man. Uh, what else do you want, want us to know, man? Um, I would say one of the things that, you know, my, my piece of this pie is a little bit more the interest rate outlook and all that. And one of the things that has been you know, that I've been worrying about for the better part of 30 years. And it's like the, the bedtime story they tell these scared economists that never comes true. Um, our, our, our whole kind of U.S. economy for, for a better part of 30 years has been uh, based on pulling off this trick of uh, our, our firms do a lot of expansion. And that is uh, usually in, in most other economies that would be financed by you and me and everybody else saving some money for retirement, et cetera. As Americans, we don't really do that um, <laughs> the, the way other countries do. Uh, so a lot of our capital markets are actually funded by money from overseas. You know, so you think about uh, a lot of the petrodollars from the Gulf and in particular Asia, Japan, and China are two of the, uh, the biggest purchasers that when, they, when the US government auctions off treasury debt, you know, as we borrow money because we, uh, uh, spend more than we collect in taxes. Uh, we're borrowing uh, a fair chunk of that from China and Japan. One of the real interesting things that's happened in just the last three weeks or so has been Japan's very lukewarm on buying our debt now. And the reason for that is they look at the yield on the 10-year treasury, they look at inflation, they look at what it costs to hedge that inflation risk, and their bonds at home are actually better than buying ours for the first time in about 20 years. Is it, do they have negative yields right now? Close to zero, they okay. do. But again, when you kind of take into the how much it costs to hedge that, you know, I get a 5% yield. So 5% more money from this bond, but prices are eight, 9% higher at the end of it. That's a losing deal for me. Um, so uh, look, this is hard for me to follow. So I'm gonna simplify <laughs> it in case you guys, can you know comprehend what what Ryan's saying? And Ryan, feel free to simplify this. You're a teacher, so this is your job. Um, so Japan says, "Hey, we've got all this money. Where can we invest it? That's super safe." And they say, "Oh, let's go buy the United States bonds. That's the safest money in the world." And for 20 years, they've been buying our bonds. Uh, so we need money. We issue bonds. People come and buy them. That gives us money, and then. 10 years later, if they bought a 10-year bond, we pay them back. And right now, 10-year bonds are what, 
2%. Let's just say they're 2%. I don't know what they are. They're 2%. And Japan is like, no, hey, we don't want to buy that. And the reason they don't want to buy it is because of, of what Ryan pointed out earlier. Yes, the bonds are 2%, but inflation is 8%. And so that's negative 5%. Well, for a while, Japanese bonds were actually negative. They're like negative 1%. Now they're close to zero. So they're like, hey, we don't want to, we don't want to buy these bonds anymore. Right. So you guys get that concept? It's 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 giving them negative money. Why is that concerning? So if sorry, I forgot. Um, if they don't buy it, we have to. And so if we have to, then we have to consume less, kind of as an American, you know, as, as a group of American consumers, we have to buy less stuff than we've gotten used to buying, or firms have to borrow less money in capital work. So this is basically just another thing that might push long-term interest rates up, right? Part of the reason we've enjoyed the nice run of low interest rates we have has been because of this, uh, you know, nonstop stream of money coming in from uh, foreign investors wanting to buy U.S. government debt. So if you have uh, less people willing to buy it and you're still trying to borrow the same amount of money that were before, well, what happens? The price of borrowing money goes up. That's probably the same. So that's like another it. interest rate wild card that's kind of coming out of the, uh, the rising push. And I just want to point out that Ryan has been worrying about this for 30 years. So, um, you know. <laughs> Hopefully I go on for another 30, right? That's right. Um, all right. I'm going to open it up to questions. You guys are going to have to talk. Whoa. All right. I'm going to adjust this. I got you, Nico. Coming to you first. Although, check, check. Nico, jump in. I have just one quick question. Isn't one way to cure that is to just print more money, but it could devaluate the dollar against other currencies, but that's what they've been doing a lot, right? I'm wrong. That is definitely the strategy that we've been using for, for a while. And what that, I want to hear from you. The print more money aspect of it is a very oversimplified version of what we've been doing uh, for a while. I would say we've been more uh, padding bank balance. I don't think it does. Is it any better? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. We'll go with MC style here, something like that. Um, we could do that. I think the uh, the short, there's a long, long, long answer. I'm happy to give you if you want to talk to me afterwards. But the short answer for now is uh, if the Fed's going to achieve this goal of bringing inflation down, what you're describing is exactly the opposite of doing that. So I, I don't think that's, if the Fed continues to follow the game plan that they you know, the Congress tells them that they have to, uh, that kind of thing is not important. So that's kind of what got us in business, in a way. That's a longer discussion. Okay. Better this way? You guys still here? All right. All right. I have a quick question, a little more uh, micro San Diego. Since we, you know, a month ago, we were starting to see a lot of money coming from the Bay Area and, um, and definitely coming from OC and you know, Orange County and, and LA areas as well, because people were able to relocate, work from home, and all that good stuff. And obviously, San, San Diego being way more affordable than those areas. So we see that we're not as affordable as we used to be, so it has switched a little bit, but we're still way more affordable than that. San Francisco is now complete, is, 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 is having some troubles for a little bit of time now in terms of real estate prices. Would you say that if we keep increasing, then we'll just lose our edge, and then we might, you know, not have that edge, but we'll move down here and then ended up moving back up there or whatever, depending on what prices go, or out of state, like you said? Not necessarily. I think there is some of that happening. You know, as you see the, the crazy price appreciation that happened in San Francisco, we offset a little bit by some of the troubles that they're missing. The, the demand is a little bit less there than it has been. But you're also seeing that, we see that from the other end, too. There's been a lot of talk. You ask anybody in Boise or Scottsdale or places like that, they think that everyone in California is leaving. No one wants to live here anymore. Um, but, it, you know, obviously, yeah, that's fine. It's warmer for us. The, um, the, the same dynamic is happening there. Prices in Phoenix, Boise, Austin, all the places that Californians typically like to move to have increased just as fast, if not faster, than prices in San Diego. So that value proposition to leave has become a lot less. I think people who have said, hey, I'm frustrated with living in Southern California and these crazy home prices, I'm going to move to Austin. Go to Austin and they're like, shoot, 
this is a nine hundred thousand dollar house in Texas. And Austin, Austin sounds real nice, but there's no beach. The beach is so much it's further really than I love breakfast tacos, but I don't love that much. So, so I think the the benefit to San Diego is that it's just intrinsically a place that people want to live. I, you know, I'm not an unbiased opinion, but I, I like it better than Orange County. I like it better than LA. Some people might like the Bay, not me. So I think um, I think that is buoys the San Diego market to some degrees because it's just always a place that people will want to live. Um, and it, when it is a good deal, you see people flood down here. When it's less of a good deal, I think it just slows. It doesn't stop. Thank you. That's a really good point, uh, and I agree with that. I, I think the, the borrowers that are coming down from the Bay Area, if you talk to them a year later, and they've recruited 10 friends. They think that this is the most amazing place, and it's not because it has great traffic. It's because the weather's a lot different than Silicon Valley. It's because the culture is a lot different than Silicon Valley. It's because it's they're not making any more of this. So the one thing that you all have going for you is I literally think that you sell the most beautiful place on the planet and people want to be here. So until that changes, I think you know, you're going to follow suit to all of the beach communities. I, I, I saw Robert first, so I'm going to go back here to Mr. Paul. Yeah, as long as Hawaii doesn't become really cheap. <laughs> If you've been to Hawaii recently, it's not <laughs> So a couple of factors. Um, you look at the demographics of population, there's something like 5 million millennials curved in the buying range. So I think they've propped up the uh, demand for housing. But what I wanted to say is when you talk about inflation, when you talk about rising rents and the rents of gone up just as much as the houses. Isn't real estate a hedge against that inflation given the rising rents? I mean, I always look at what, you know, Blackstone and the big guys are doing. And, you know, the guys are buying, they're buying rental property. And, and you got rental property that maybe not appreciating at 18%. Maybe it'll slow at five or six. Stop, dump cheaper than the price of borrowing, and you've got rents going up. So I think that we are looking at a market here that's going to turn into a landlord market. And the smart money is going to be buying units and rental properties, and they're going to hold on, and they're going to be fine. And I think that's going to, that's going to propel or hold the market. I agree with Nico said. Um, I just think it all comes down to supply and demand. And in this micro market, you know, we're going 170 miles an hour now. Maybe we'll slow down to 75 miles an hour and we'll head towards normalcy. Yeah, I think I agree with you that the, if I just look at what, what I do, and I work with builders and developers throughout Southern California, going back five years in time, I would say that you know, probably 80% of my work was strictly for sale housing. In the last two years, it's probably, and the other 20% being rental. In the last two years, it's probably been more like 60, 40, where there's just an increasing number of people and groups like, like you mentioned that are very well funded and looking at the rental market as a hedge against any sort of softening in the, the for sale market. So, um, you're right from a demographic standpoint that you know with millennials getting older i think there are there are a lot of the first time home buyers in other markets the groups behind them now are have a somewhat different lifestyle that they're used to they're used to higher density they're used to renting for longer um they're more accepting of a sort of condo lifestyle so we might see um increased demand for that higher density stuff uh, which is obviously not as common here in north county but a big part of the downtown San Diego market, and a big part of LA and, and parts of Orange County now too. Hey, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let this Ryan ask another question, but uh, Radcliffe, I remember that you said something about demographics as well. Is it pertinent to what's what we're talking about right now? If not, hold it. Okay. Um, Scott, I, I guess a follow-up question. Uh, our group does some single-family home development, just you know, spec homes. Uh, what are you telling, given the economic environment, given and that, and maybe Ryan, you can comment on stagflation. It seems like we might have low growth, high inflation. What are you telling uh, builders, developers, 
you know, over the next year, two years, because builders have to be thinking three to three to five years out. Uh, what do you are they are they optimistic? Are they going more multifamily? Are they you know second home community for the higher end? What what do you see? I think that we've been telling builders for a few years now, really, in places where you can to pivot to more affordable price points if you can do so. But you, obviously, you can't do that in every market. It's hard to, to hit an affordable price point in Encinitas because it's it's just going to be expensive and getting anything that's dense is, is very hard to do. But where you can um, pivot to a more, either a more efficient product, whether that's a smaller home, multiple homes, or home with an ADU or, or multiple living spaces built into it, that helps. Um, but that there's still strong demand from uh, in, in more desirable markets. The demand from move-up buyers is, is still there, as you guys are all a testament to, that people still want nice new homes in, in nice locations. There's still a strong preference for that traditional single-family home with a driveway that you can park some cars in in the backyard. You can actually use uh, wherever it's it's um, it's feasible to do so. So as long as the, the advice that we've been giving more than ever recently is um, just be realistic in what you're expecting prices to do. If you're, if you're underwriting to today's prices and today's costs, you should be fine. And if there's a, some slowdown or, or a dip in prices two years from now, or even a year from now, it's probably gonna be offset by price appreciation over the next six months. Um, but cost is the unknown factor. So just as long as you're not getting too aggressive and baking in appreciation into your pro forma, which has definitely been going on. And I, and I think we'll see if things do slow down who's kind of you know, been, uh, been doing that more than some other builders uh, if, if things do slow down. But it, as long as you're being realistic, I think uh, the fundamentals are still very strong. Thanks, Scott. Um, a question was, a couple of questions have been passed to me via notes. Uh, one, do you see a return to the gold standard coming? Either of you? No. Okay. Scott? No? Don't see that? Okay. Uh, with, with crypto, that's actually a, a really common question that I get. Um, Another question, what are you telling first-time home buyers? They literally cannot get into the market. And this goes back to the affordability question. I'll answer this first. And that is like, I said it to you all already, like quite vulnerably, I am scared that my kids are not going to be able to afford real estate here. Like that's my fear, right? I think all of our clients are really scared that, you know, that, the housing market's going to crash or that their interest rate is going to go up. I'm more fearful uh, of, hey, how, how is it possible that, you know, the wealth disparity doesn't get bigger uh, and San Diego only comes a place for those halves and it, it's really hard to get in there. Uh, and, and I will share that what I have heard from another economist, uh, you know, Jerry, that, that runs the forecast is that affordability uh, is not going to be a problem in San Diego for the reasons these guys just said. They're not making any more San Diegos. And there's a ton of wealth on this planet and they are going to come here. So keeping housing affordable in San Diego, in my opinion, is a fool's errand. It's yeah. not going to happen. So uh, unless there's a ton of density and we have regulation, um, I think I think getting in like a, the first home, first time home buyer chasing down a what what a year ago was a million dollar track home in La Costa, and is now you know two million dollar track. Um, I don't think that that's going to continue. That's going to be more normal. That's going to go from two million to two million fifty to two million one. But get in the market, sacrifice, get a condo, go east, but get in. Otherwise, you are a renter or you're moving. Um, so. That's my opinion. What do you guys say about the same question? Well, one thing I know I've seen in San Diego in particular is that there are a lot of parents who help their kids buy their first house, right? And so that's a way where kind of the windfall that I received, you know, buying a buying a house in 2008, um, I can, my kids are in high school at this point, it's a little early to be talking about it. But, you know, it is on my mind that that's going to be one of the ways that you kind of pay it forward and give them the ability to live in this great place that I that I got to live in. You know, the, the problem is, is that that kind of bakes in a weird, 
you know, class system almost of the, we've lived here for a long time and that's the only reason that the current generation can afford to live here and anybody who's moving here or who has been, you know, clawing their way up to a higher standard of living than their parents had, that option isn't necessarily available. So, I mean, I think going back big picture, the affordability question of how do you have, uh, you know, just a statistic that I like to drop on uh, people that I think is often underappreciated. Uh, if you look at San Diego County is actually very well situated relative to the national average. We have about one third of our population that has a bachelor's degree, right? You started ever thinking every, literally every single person I know has a bachelor's degree, right? That's just sort of the weird, yeah, you move in circles of people that are like you, but you know, when two thirds of the population, two thirds of the workforce, where are they going to live? The economy needs them, right? We are a very... You know, our economy needs that diversity of, uh, of experience and job holders and all that. And, you know, if there's no, that's, that's the affordability question that I think is kind of the long run. What do we do about that? That's going to be one of the critical things for kind of long run 30 years or so. Um, of the I don't really have any good answers. I'm afraid I'm still thinking about it. Uh, the only thing I'll add to that is that I think at some point it just, you have to acknowledge that San Diego is not a starter home market. Um, you still want young people to live here, young professionals, you know, are, are some of them are gonna start their careers here. They'll, they will probably be forced to rent. That doesn't mean that you can't, uh, there's a couple scenarios in that, either when you're starting a family, trying to buy that first home, you relocate to another market for a, a brief period of time and come back, or you continue to rent where you wanna live. I know a few people who rent in from Del Mar to, to Carlsbad, and own properties in the Coachella Valley, or they own properties in Arizona or in Huntsville, Alabama, someplace where you can go buy a single family home for $150,000 or something like that, rent it out, be positive cash flow, and be building equity, even if it's on a much lower basis. But you're still not you know, stuck in that renter class with no equity being built up forever. So it's a good way to get a toe into the home ownership market. But Obviously, that's not ideal, but there's not an ideal solution. We're not going to come up with some well-located sub-market in San Diego where you build a whole bunch of new houses that, for some reason, we just didn't see. <laughs> one other, I mean, one of the joys and pains of my life is I spent a lot of time around 20-year-olds, and um, so some recent graduates who have, uh, you know, gone up uh, for kind of the 21st century Bay Area gold rush, uh, they have this crazy scheme that they've hatched where one or two of them buy the house and they rent out the other rooms in the house to their, and it's like a, you know, seven or eight person party house hacking. and they're all 20. Yeah, house hacking, exactly this idea. And I just thought, what an entrepreneurial genius you are of <laughs> coming up with a, a crazy way. You know, this is sort of what I was mentioning, you know, before about the multiple generations of one house. This is sort of the 20 year old's version of that, that we're gonna have the same party house that we had on the beach here in San Diego. But I'm gonna, you know, I can borrow enough money from, from dad to be able to be the one whose name's on the deed and I get the rent flow from everybody else. So all right, so I've been handing the microphone and I think what you guys have kind of segued into is just a big question is um we've talked about like 20 year olds, we've talked about kind of the the potential recession, but jobs, J O B, I'm not talking about us realtors, I'm talking about our clients. Uh, you know, we know that recessions can be bad for employers as well. Is there anything that you guys can use in your templates from previous recessions, you know, going back 40, 30, 20 years that you can potentially forecast or lend or even just opine on about what unemployment could potentially look like or where things are? You know, what's your thumbprint on what the job and employment history is? even including affordability here in San Diego, you just mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of people, teachers, firefighters, that, you know, you mentioned Encinitas being totally NIMBY. I agree with you. I see townhomes being trying to be built and they're getting run out of town by the neighbors because they don't want, you know, affordable housing. But affordable housing could be something that's making 90 or $100,000 a year. But it's, it's still, so, I'm just curious that it's a two pronged question, but the first one is it's like, so the next year or so, is there any indication about what that could look like? And then also going forward, what economists have proposed for, you know, keeping the people that 
you know, teach our kids, you know, drive the fire fire, drive the fire trucks, and you know, work amongst us, but want to afford a home. <laughs> okay, you're gonna you're gonna tackle affordable housing and paying teachers more and all that, and I just have to talk about unemployment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that deal. Um, so one of the things that I've seen kind of being a college professor over the span of several recessions is that graduating in the middle of a recession is a pretty awful experience, right? You just, you know, it's sort of like trying to buy a house. You put out a bunch of resumes, but nobody's answering the phone and you just have to hustle and hustle and hustle and hustle. Um, Studies have shown that it does impact your lifetime earnings because it just takes you a little longer to get started and all of that. And I think that, you know, if we do have, you know, and again, I guess let me be clear on timing. There's nothing right now. I, I, I have a couple of good go to indicators that I feel like tell me nine to 12 months if there's going to be a recession, there'd be a couple of red lights that I can see now. I don't see any of those right now. So everything I'm talking about is kind of 18 months out at the you know, that, that kind of horizon, 18, 24 months. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I do, it, it definitely does have an impact graduating in the middle of a recession, but part of the reason you go to college, you know, we say it's to earn more money, but one of the other remarkable things is just the unemployment experience is so much better in terms of the number of times you're going to be unemployed in your life, how long you're going to be unemployed all your life. The master's degree is the single best piece of insurance you can get against that. Uh, that said, Two thirds of San Diegans do not have a bachelor's degree. Two thirds of the workers in our economy are working in jobs that uh, you know that uh, that don't have that kind of cushion. And so I think recessions fall disproportionately on uh, on that group. Um, I kind of like I said, I'm in the middle of about an 80 minute lecture on unemployment and its demographics. I'm going to probably declare victory right there. Happy to come back if you got any uh, anything more specific. But uh, yes, so the solution to affordable housing. Here we go. <laughs> possible, possible things to ease the affordable housing crisis. It's definitely not, a, definitely not an all-inclusive solution. But there, I mean, there's a few prongs that I think the, an approach could take. Um, the first one is just acknowledging that more people are going to be renters. Acknowledging that we need to build more rental housing. It needs to be nicer because these are going to be people who are. It's going to be more families. It's going to be people who would typically in the past have been homeowners. Um, so these need to be newer, nicer units, kind of get past the stigma of I don't want an apartment community in my neighborhood, which is there's always such strong pushback to, to that. You know, rentals can be new and nice if, you, if you've done. If you look at some of the stuff that in, in Irvine specifically, it feels like a single family neighborhood. You've got garages. It's not a bunch of street parking like you see in kind of your old garden style apartments that just turn into a zoo that floods into the, the surrounding streets. So there's a good way to do that. That's prong number one. And I think that's starting to happen and uh, it's just kind of over become, overcoming that nimbyism is kind of the next step that needs to happen. Um, the next one to affordable housing is just be more creative in what for sale housing looks like and where we can build it. A big part of that is finding assets that are already developed that are being underutilized. Big push for that right now is shopping malls. You know, you've got a lot of shopping malls located that have that are amazingly located near transit. They have a whole bunch of parking that's already there. All the traffic impact is already realized in the community, built into their plans. Those are the three things that are usually the biggest pushback trying to build new homes, and specifically when you're trying to build homes at higher density. So coming in, taking down portions of malls, replacing them with condos, replacing them with apartments, it's a kind of a win-win and kind of a symbiotic relationship that A, helps a, a mall that's really struggling to find what, a, what is my place in this new economic environment and is, is some solution for um, creating more housing, even if it is definitely skewed towards that. So um, I'm gonna interrupt uh, our program here for one second. So the questions that are coming in now, I've just answered another question about, you know, where are our servers and our teachers and our, Firefighter is going to work, which is along the same line. And um, I was talking with Scott about this before, and I would love it if both of you could come. But um, I had a conversation with a partner at Alan Atkins, and Alan Atkins is a really large real estate firm uh, with several bases, one of them here in San Diego. And what's unique about Tim Hutter is that he has successfully uh, lobbied the city of Encinitas a couple of different times on policy. 
And what you guys are asking right now is more policy on real estate. And so he's agreed to come. And I think it would be great, especially if Scott, if you could be there at the same time. I know that you guys work together. Uh, and the timing is actually really good because there's a lot of stuff that's going on around housing policy and uh, affordable housing. And so those questions, uh, if you guys are interested, we'll do another gathering, we'll bring him in. Um, and a lot of these questions, we really can make a difference as a group uh, one way or the other. And, and what Scott's saying is like that advocacy really needs to take place. So if you're interested in that, um, just make sure that you let Jared know uh, and, and we'll make sure to circulate that information and you'll all be invited to that. But um, he's a wealth of knowledge on ADUs, housing policy, what it's like to get uh, you know more density and uh, uh, how to how to get more housing built, uh, you know that sort of thing. So if you want to be a part of that, I feel like that might be policy questions might be better directed to that. Uh, I feel like Scott probably has a lot of a lot of knowledge on that too because he's constantly helping developers who are having a tough time uh, getting houses built. But that's another another thing that we can powwow on. And that doesn't mean you can't ask the questions here today. I just mean we'll go a little deeper on that because it seems like you all really want it. Uh, who else has questions? We got about 20 more minutes coming to you. Oh, and then Bible. When are you next? This is kind of piggybacking on his comments earlier um, as far as opening up other uses for housing. Um, has there been any push for office space conversions to like condominiums with all the work at home remote workers now? Is that? Yeah, yeah it's definitely, definitely similar to how people are reevaluating uses of mall properties. Um, the good news about malls and offices is that the large portfolios are typically owned by groups with a lot of financial savvy and a lot of expertise. They talk to them all the time. They're very forward thinking. So they, they do look at this. Um, they won't be slow to act if they do see um, the office market as permanent, the demand for office space is being permanently lower, which I think we've all kind of expected that that is going to be the new norm, but there's just a lower need for actual physical office spaces more people are used to and prefer to work from home like i do um but i think we're waiting to see kind of what the new normal actually is as we fully get out of out of uh covid and kind of the economy normalizes a little bit before any big moves are, are made in that space i think we're, people are, are kind of teed up to make some changes and maybe re uh develop stuff into a more of a housing use whether that's for sale or for rent but right now i think we're looking for a little bit more clarity on what the office of the future is actually going to be. Because I don't, frankly, I think it's still the answer to that question is still being figured out. The only thought I would add to that is that the zoning discussion around that is an unholy nightmare. <laughs> there we go. Very good. So I, I just a lot of question around inflation. We talk a lot about it today. When do we anticipate peak inflation? Uh, heard some things in market. Want to get your guys's kind of intake uh, or input on that? Uh, I guess the first disclaimer I will say is that anybody who claims to have a definitive answer to that is just guessing. So I will give you my guess. Um, you know, I really like to frame it as that kind of tug of war between demand and supply, right? That's what's driving inflation. And if we keep having this dynamic of lots and lots of people wanting to buy all sorts of stuff. And we're not the market isn't able to, to bring it to market, prices are going to continue to accelerate. Um, so the change has to be one of two things. Like you said, either the supply side constraints ease and we figure out again how to make supply chains work and that sort of thing. And you know, it's anybody's guess. I'm a little bit worried about what I hear coming out of China right now, that that is longer away than I would have thought two or three months ago. Um, the demand side again is just this question about what what uh, what pace is the Fed going to raise interest rates at, and how much is that going to slow down the demand side? But generally speaking, historically, these kind of things play out over a span of years. You know, if you think that we first kind of got serious about fighting inflation in '79, and it was peak inflation was kind of '81, and then it kind of came back down to a level they were happy with in '84. So that kind of multi-year time horizon, like that's why, you know, they often say you don't want to let the genie out of the bottle when you're talking about inflation. We kind of have let the genie out of the bottle because it's really, really, really hard to get back in. It's painful. You have to do it with a recession and it takes a lot of time, you know, multiple years. 
So, you know, I think peak inflation being a year or two out is probably my just off the cuff guess, but I want to kind of give it some, just that it has so much momentum too. One of the nasty things about inflation is that everybody starts to assume it's going to be there. So the next time I go negotiate a contract or borrow money, or I'm going to say, ask for a raise at work, I'm going to say, well, you see what's going on with prices? You better give me an 8% raise. And then all of a sudden my firm's cost just went up by 8%. They have to pass that along to the consumer again. And so it just kind of turns into this snowball of you expect inflation. So you negotiate your contracts on the basis of it, and then you get more inflation. And breaking that cycle is really, really, really tough. And that's, you know, unfortunately, I think we're going to revisit this kind of uh, back to the future, early 80s experience again. Thank you for that. Do you see any impact of the election in November having potential to impact those stocks? So the Federal Reserve is set up very specifically to be insulated from political pressure. At least that's the theory. The reason being is that they need to be the bad guy, right? No elected official on God's green earth is going to say, you know, inflation's awfully high. So right before an election, what I want to do is make sure that a lot of people are unemployed, right? If you're going to rely on elected officials to fight inflation, you're going to see rapid inflation. So you kind of need uh, a largely insulated from politics central bank to do the dirty work there because it's going to be very, very unpopular. Uh, that said, that Congress loves to threaten the Fed with, uh, you know, we're going to audit you, see what you've been doing with all of these, uh, you know, uh, quantitative easing purchases, see if there's anything naughty in there that we want to get into. So periodically they drag Fed people up to the hill, they have hearings, and it's just sort of a, we gave you your independence and we can take it away. So if we don't like what you're doing, although, so there's always that specter, but I, I mean, who the hell knows in the current political environment? I feel like everything that I would have said is kind of a, there's no way any American politician goes there. It seems like we do these days. But uh, threatening the Fed's independence, kind of moving for more congressional oversight or those sort of taking some of the, that away would have been an absolute third rail. Nobody's going to go near that even just five years ago. I don't know now, especially with kind of the... Uh, we saw some politics around a Fed appointment recently. One of the board of governors, there was there was some political discussion uh, that caused a nominee to step down and put another one forward and all that. Um, so I feel like politics is encroaching on the Fed's business a little more than it has in the past. But I don't think we're at the point where you know you've seen in, in other countries around the world where yes, we have a central bank that they do what the government says, and that's the place where you get kind of run away you know, 20, 30, 40% inflation. I don't think we're anywhere in that scenario yet, but but even the slightest move towards Congress being a little bit more overtly, you know, flexing, saying, you know, you remember who's in charge here, always worries people. Thank you. All right, um, we've got time for two more questions, three more questions maybe. It's, a, it's about 5.20 uh, right now, and I just want to leave a little bit of time to wrap up. Normally this meeting ends at five, but tonight's special, so we're going to go to five thirty. Um, so we got time for two or three more questions. Uh, so you've touched on like Fed funds rate, you touched on the short term rate, um, and you talked a little bit about at the beginning about just um, a big part of their job, kind of forecasting and projecting, and that just kind of starts to be baked in, um, and not like that's what the market does, right? So. I'm curious your guys' thoughts on how much of that um, forecast for the interest rate, like raises or increases that they're going to make, like how much of that's already baked in. Um, so um, there's the answer to this question is probably a semester long, I'm afraid, but I'll, I'll try to give you the, uh, the short version. Um, we usually say that a long-term interest rate is the average of the short-term interest rates that are expected to prevail in the lifetime of the bond. So, uh, you know, the 10-year uh, treasury being a rough guide of, you know, the average of the one-year interest rates is supposed to. Um, so you can play the game a little bit of, 
this is kind of more a finance version of this, frankly. Um, well, if the 10 year treasury is this, then it implies this sort of path for future interest rates. There's actually futures on that's funds rate. I mean, so I, I go to nerd town on this all day long. Um, what I will say though, is more of the basic sort of supply and demand factors. Um, the Fed is about to unload a whole bunch of long-term bonds, mortgage-backed securities, et cetera, as part of their reducing the size of their balance sheet. You're going to read that a lot in the paper tomorrow when they start talking about what came out of the Fed meeting. Um, that combined with the Asia seems to be a little less interested in buying these before. So much of the long-term interest rates about these supply and demand factors more than anything else. So... Um, the risk premium that's baked into those future forecasts is a little tough. I will say that I think that the a lot of the market seems to be under, you know, it's more the, I think Powell's going to slow play this. You know, we kind of have like every single bank on the planet will give you some forecast for, we expect this many more, this many basis point raises between now and the end of the year. Um, I think all of those are the, we're going to continue to baby step this along and hope that the supply chain bails us out. Uh, if I have made you a little more pessimistic about that, then I feel like maybe I have done my job today. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I, I think I'll, I, I'm happy to get in a little more detail, but like I said, that's a pretty technical discussion. Yeah, um, a, lot, a lot to unpack there for sure. Um, two more questions. Who's got a good one? Homes and uh, the eggs. and kind of like the frog in the water. I'm not really sure what saved me or got me out or killed me. So I can't remember, and I'm feeling for a history lesson. What got us out of the last one? And does it have any lessons for us? So specific to the housing market or just how we beat how we beat the 70s inflation? inflation. Yeah, so we had a, uh, I mean, we the, the root causes of it again are a thing, but we could just sort of say, all right, by 1979, we had uh, 12 to 14% annual inflation, and a new sheriff came to town. We appointed a new chair of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, and, you know, just basically said, you guys have been screwing around, not doing what, uh, not following your mission statement, and it's time to uh, it's time to do something about it, and to do something about it was that 900 basis point increase in interest rates I was talking about. And we had a pretty bad recession, 1980, you know, it's actually kind of called a double dip recession sometimes, but I like to think of it as one big mess from 1981 to 19, the end of 1982, uh, where, yeah, we saw um, prior to the Great Recession, that was the highest level of unemployment we've seen since World War II uh, in that recession. So that was a, this is, so so the, the, the story that you all learned in, in macro history would have been inflation was really awful. The economy suffered tremendously to beat it. Let's never do that again. Well, here we are. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, in terms of it was double digit, it started out higher than where we are now. But it was a 7% or so increase in unemployment that those interest rate hikes created, and it lasted uh, longer than a typical recession would uh, because the Fed had to keep unemployment high, had to keep that you know, spending down to, to, take the, uh, uh, to take the pressure off of prices. So timeline-wise, like I said, sort of inflation and unemployment kind of only got back if they started kind of the war in 79, it was really probably late 83 or 84 before things had flowed back to normal. All right. Um, sorry. No, don't, don't be sorry. Um, all right. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, takeaways, right? Because I, I think, I think the, all of this information uh, is great, but what do we do? What, what are we going to tell our clients, right? So, my turn. <laughs> so uh, the, the fundamental takeaways are, I think all of us believe that while, you know, it may cool off, may even have a small dip in the long term, um, this market is not showing us any signs of crashing uh, in any way, shape or form, right? Uh, interest rates don't have as much hope as I thought they were uh, to come crashing back down. So. 
I think I think things are going to cool off at some point. Uh, so, you know, your buyers who are waiting on the sidelines uh, are probably looking at more houses to offer on, um, but there there stands to be a pretty big chance that those are going to be more expensive. Why are they going to be more expensive? Because these guys are expecting in the short term crazy growth like we have right now, uh, and in the medium and long term more sustained growth, maybe even a little bit of a dip. So if they're brilliant, I mean, these guys can't time the dip, but if they're brilliant, maybe they can. And some of your clients are brilliant, I know that. Um, and, and here's the thing with interest rates, you can always restructure them, right? So how many people believe uh, in the last seven recessions that housing prices have gone down? Down, down, anybody? Yeah. So they did in two of the last seven. Uh, and it looks like this on a graph, like you could barely, barely tell it, right? What's that? 2009. 2009, that recession, they looked like this. <laughs> uh, but the other one uh, looks like that. Um, interest rates uh, typically do come down uh, in recessions. Out of the last seven, uh, I think all but one of them, rates have come down. So that's not saying, and, and I think Ryan laid out some really good information here, but in the last seven recessions, interest rates came down and, and only two of those uh, did prices come down. And one of those was 2009, uh, where prices came down a bunch. Uh, and I've got a really sweet graph, as does Eric, that kind of shows this. And so, um, you know, as a takeaway, what we'll do is we'll type up these notes and try to get them to you in a palatable form for a client uh, that just says, hey, we, I, I got these two economists, you, you can say that, uh, and here's what they said, um, it's going to happen, like, hey, don't blame me, blame these two guys, um, <laughs> Scott, job. Scott, that's your job, that's your job, Brian, that's your job, um, I wanted to, to end this thing by just saying thank you. Um, you guys are such a great group of people. Um, and you know, the, the folks that are here all the time, um, we talk about it all the time, how great this group is, uh, and just what a gifted group of real estate agents you are. You guys are really uh, the, the best of the best. And uh, we appreciate it. Also just wanted to say thank you to the sponsors. Uh, Rory, Lisa, uh, the First American Crew, Heritage Escrow. Uh, thank you so much uh, to, to Eric and myself, Made of Wood. Uh, we appreciate it. And last but not least, uh, Ryan Scott. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm so impressed by your knowledge. Uh, how you had an answer for every single question. Uh, I feel like we're a lot more empowered to go out and uh, and talk to our clients now.